In John MacArthur's lifetime, he's preached more than 10,000 sermons, most of them at Grace Community Church, but he's also preached at conferences, camps, schools, other churches, weddings, funerals. And whether home or away, John nearly always explains a text of Scripture. He doesn't talk about the headlines or the latest controversy in the evangelical church. But once every few years, an event, some catastrophe, consumes the world and occupies all the space inside people's heads. And in those moments, John has stood in the pulpit and brought the Bible to bear on the issue of the day. In 1992, as riots tore apart Los Angeles, John set aside his normal pulpit ministry to preach a sermon entitled, The Los Angeles Riots, A Biblical Perspective. This morning, I, I want to endeavor, by the Lord's help, to give you a perspective on what we've seen this week in our city. I would be unfaithful to the task of the prophet and the shepherd if I didn't endeavor to comment on it. A few years later, the Northridge earthquake devastated the San Fernando Valley. Every member of Grace Church was affected in some way on Monday, January 17, 1994. John MacArthur was in the middle of a series from the book of Revelation. Instead of going on to the next passage, he shepherded his flock with a sermon entitled, 14 Lessons from the Earthquake. This is a profound teacher, an earthquake like this, and the lessons it teaches are equally profound. And in 2015, after the Supreme Court's monumental same-sex marriage ruling, he responded with a sermon called, We Will Not Bow. These are going to be very challenging days. We will not bow. We will be gracious and we will be loving, but we will render to God what is God's. In the first five decades of ministry, there are maybe a dozen sermons like that. In today's episode, we're going to look at two that are arguably the most significant. Sermons that John preached after terrorist attacks. One was an assault on the country, the other on the church. One took thousands of lives, and the other threatened to undermine the reputation of Christ's bride. My name is Austin Duncan. I'm the director of the MacArthur Center for Expository Preaching at the Master Seminary. This is the podcast from the Center, and this is Season 1, The Expositor, The Life and Preaching of John MacArthur. Where were you on September 11th, 2001? What? 911 emergency? Hello? Who are you talking to? At 8.46 a.m., terrorists hijacked American Airlines Flight 11 and flew it into the North Tower of the World Trade Center. 17 minutes later, United Flight 175 flew into the South Tower. Less than two hours later, both towers had collapsed. Millions of Americans watched the news coverage of what was happening in New York City and listened as anchors like ABC's Peter Jennings tried to grasp the moment's horror. It's hard to put it into words, and maybe one doesn't need to. Both trade towers 
where thousands of people work on this day, Tuesday, have now been attacked and destroyed with thousands of people either in them or in the immediate area adjacent to them. This is, there is simply no way to accurately describe the emotion this evokes in people all over the world. Terrorists hijacked two more commercial planes. One plane flew into the Pentagon in Washington, D.C. The other, bound for either the United States Capitol or the White House, crashed in the Pennsylvania countryside. 2,996 people died that day. It was, and still is, the deadliest terrorist attack in human history. That night, President Bush addressed the nation from the Oval Office. Thousands of lives were suddenly ended by evil, despicable acts of terror. The pictures of airplanes flying into buildings, fires burning, huge, huge structures collapsing, have filled us with disbelief, terrible sadness, and a quiet, unyielding anger. Well, I do remember the day as if it was yesterday. You may already recognize that voice, but if you don't, it's Carl Miller. For 30 years, he hosted Grace to Use radio show. For much of that time, his day job was with the Salem Media Group, the largest Christian media company in the world. And on 9-11, he worked at Salem's New York City affiliate, WMCA 102.3 FM, The Mission. Here he is describing what it was like to watch the day's events unfold with his own eyes. Our offices and studios, which were in the New Jersey Meadowlands, literally across the Hudson River from Manhattan. Uh, and I did not see the Manhattan skyline until literally moments before I reached uh, our studios, uh, just because of the, the, the terrain of the land, I hit a high spot. And I remember as I hit it that day, I could see the skyline and the sky was as blue as could be. And the smoke was coming out of the top of the tower at that time. By the time I got into the office, of course, the staff was all glued. We're in the high-rise building in the Meadowlands uh, in, uh, in uh, Rutherford, New Jersey, where the New York Giants Stadium is. And uh, so we're watching all of this going on in Manhattan. It was like we had the long shots from our office window and the, uh, and the uh, news media at that point in time was giving us all kinds of close-up shots with their helicopters and other things flying around. Uh, the, the Bay Area looking at the towers. The explosion was totally shocking and uh, I, I can't quite, still can't quite articulate what the feelings and the emotions were that day because they just were so uh, raw and disbelief and denial and no, this can't be, what does this mean? And No matter where you lived, you probably felt the same shock, disbelief and sadness that Carl experienced. And I'm sure you were asking the same questions. What does this mean? How will this affect my family? Is our country secure? Why did this happen? What is the message here? You know, why would God let this happen? And that um, that was a question that every everybody was asking. So, um, I, I think that the, what draws me to an event like that is the reality that this is the first thing on people's minds, and they need to understand it biblically. And if I think something fits that category, I'll interrupt a series. The following Sunday, September sixteenth, two thousand one, America went to church. Estimates are that attendance increased as much as 40% five days after the events of 9-11. Grace Community Church was packed. 
Nathan Buznitz was there that Sunday. He teaches church history at the Master Seminary. In 2001, he was a newlywed and a student at TMS. We all came to church with a real sense of anticipation because we were eager to hear what our pastor's perspective was going to be on this historic tragic event that had just taken place and it was an epic evening uh, there were tons of people on campus probably 5,000 people on campus for an evening service they were in the worship center they were in the gym they were in the chapel it was overflow capacity everyone just so intensely eager to hear what the word of God had to say about this particular uh, event. Jesse Johnson had just moved to California to attend Grace Community Church and the Master Seminary. September 16th, 2001 was only his third or fourth Sunday at the church. He came to the morning service sure that MacArthur was going to talk about 9-11. Instead, this is what he remembers MacArthur saying the first time he stepped into the pulpit. I remember the first time it was addressed in the service was Pastor John saying, you know, we are here this week to talk about an event that has changed all of our lives. It's altered the way we view the world and it will impact us um, for the rest of our lives. And uh, it just it's, it will shape us. And that event, of course, is the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that definitely set the tone for the rest of the morning. And for me, as, as a Christian, I stopped being a seminary student at that point and started processing it as a Christian. And I, I realized that the death and resurrection in a new way is gonna impact and influence my life more than anything in you know, the contemporary world, even something as significant as this, that first and foremost, that we're at church to worship Christ. In the face of this world-changing event, MacArthur preached the gospel as scheduled. He prioritized the verse-by-verse -verse proclamation of God's word in the Gospel of Luke. That night, he would interrupt his series to address the issues everyone was facing from a biblical perspective. First, he preached the next verse. Then, multitudes of people came back that night to listen as MacArthur took on the role of shepherd and prophet and helped his people understand the attack that had just taken place. The evening was comical. I mean, there were people set up outside. Uh, the fountain wasn't, wasn't there, but that whole driveway had been filled with, with chairs. Um, they had speakers outdoors. The gym was packed. Um, they were doing overflow in different rooms. The chapel was uh, um, live streaming it, broadcasting it in there. And it, I had never seen so many people at uh, Grace Church before. Um, I sat in the gym on the very front row under the, the big <clears throat> screen on the side so I could barely see it. I'd look, look straight up and there were just people everywhere. At the time, I knew something about Islam, but not enough to be able to explain why they did this. So between that Tuesday and Sunday, I had to, to basically do research on Muslim terrorists, Muslim suicide and w why they would do that what the benefits were, what compelled them to do that. So by Sunday, I had put together a whole sort of biblical uh, understanding of um, Islam and um, what motivated people to do that kind of thing. And I had to speak to it because it, it just dominated media and dominated everybody's attention. The whole world had seen those towers fall. They'd watched the footage over and over again. And now they wanted to know why. So when thousands gathered at Grace Church that Sunday evening, looking for answers, what did MacArthur say? On Tuesday, we all saw the most uh, deadly attack on America ever. 
And the images are embedded deeply in our minds at this time and probably will remain for a long time. Death and devastation of such monumental proportions that it makes the attack on Pearl Harbor the only comparison that we can think of. And we all know what happened. In our media-dominated age, we don't lack for visual images or verbal explanations. But our minds cry out to know why it happened. In fact, it seems to me in America we are obsessed with why things happen. Whenever there is an airplane crash, whenever there is a crime of newspaper proportions, we want to know why these things happen. We have all of these agencies and all of the analysts and psychologists and criminologists, people who study all of the details trying to find a motive for why these things happen. Why do people do these kinds of things? I want to try to give you answers to that. And what was the first reason John MacArthur gave for why terrorists hijacked planes and attacked the United States? There is a natural reason for this. A natural reason. Sociologists in modern days and psychologists have been trying to convince us that man is basically good. But he is not. Man is basically evil. He is basically wicked. The heart of man is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked, the Bible says. And who can know it? That is, who can figure it out? It is so desperately wicked. If you don't believe that man is desperately wicked, you can't understand an event like 9-11. Without the doctrine of total depravity, you have no category for terrorism and the pain, suffering, and fear can be consuming. There's secondly historical motivation. This introduces us to another category. In order to get to the heart of this, we have to go back to the Middle East again, back to the land of the Bible, back to the very origins of the nations, and that puts us right back in the book of Genesis. From there, John MacArthur takes a deep dive into the Old Testament. He talks about Abraham, Isaac, and Ishmael. He describes all the fighting over the promised land, and he traces a line from those ancient conflicts to the Middle East of today and the terrorist attacks of 9-11. I don't want to oversimplify it because there are complexities and complications in understanding the history of the Middle East, but I'm going to try to give you an understanding that is clear enough for you to get a grasp on what's going on. Pastor John, uh, as I recall, got up to preach probably around 6.30. I don't remember exactly, but that would be pretty typical for an evening service. And he preached until at least 8 o'clock, maybe 8.15. It was, it was an epic message, um, likely 45 minutes longer than a normal message. John spoke for precisely one hour and 36 minutes that Sunday evening. It's one of the longest sermons he's ever preached, and no one even thought about leaving early. Time passed so quickly because we were just so engaged because of the moment and because of the truth that was being brought to bear on the moment. When it ended, it was there, was, there were not people leaving early, I and mean, people wanted to know everything he had to say about it. As John took his people through a history of the Middle East, a contrast of Muslim and Christian theology, and a look at the religious motives of the terrorists, he was building toward a powerful, prophetic conclusion. I want to give you one last reason, and this is the real reason that we need to understand. Theological reason. Why did it happen? Why did all those people die? I'll tell you why. Because the wages of sin is death. That's why. Because it's appointed unto men once to what? Die. I don't know how else to say it. Nothing happened to those people on Tuesday that wasn't going to happen anyway. They were all going to die. Just not then, they thought. Nothing extraordinary about people dying. Maybe that sounds harsh to your ears. But this kind of sobering, warning message is part of the pastor's job description. Charles Simeon in the 18th century said it this way. 
to warn people of danger is the kindest act of love. At this point in his message, John turns to Luke 13, verses 1 through 5, a story about Galileans murdered by Pilate and 18 Israelites buried under a tower. They had their own trade center, the tower in Siloam. And it fell over one day. Wasn't hit by an airplane, but somehow probably poor construction. Maybe an earthquake, it fell over. 18 people are walking down the street. Tower falls on them. Kills them all. And the question in their minds is, why does this happen to these people? Are these people worse than all the rest of the people who live in Jerusalem? Jesus' answer, verse 5, I tell you, no, no, they aren't any worse than you. But unless you repent, you will also perish. People in the Pentagon, people in those World Trade Center towers perished. I'm sure some of them were believers. Some were not. And the ones who were not perished, went to hell forever, without God, without hope. They weren't worse than anybody else. You'll perish too if you don't repent. That's the message. That's God's message. It's been 20 years since the events of 9-11. So I asked John MacArthur about that sermon and how John was both serving his flock and proclaiming truth in the world. And, and I think what people find there is they find a pastor who understands his flock. This is, this is the pressing question. Not that's just going to mark a normal Tuesday, but obviously a, a historic day not to be forgotten and you're equipping them to understand not just this event from a worldview but also to think about their own souls right jesus uh, interaction with the pharisees was kind of the, the formula behind that jesus said to them you you tell the weather rather in an amateur way you know if the sky is red or if you see a cloud you tell the weather but you don't know the signs of the times and what an indictment. The religious leaders of Israel couldn't read history. They couldn't read what was going on in the world and and um, what reflected the sinfulness of the world and what reflected the, reflected the work of God and his judgment. So that, that sort of uh, was a mandate to me to make sure that in my preaching and my teaching, I was always helping people view the world biblically. And while most of life comes down to our personal issues and personal problems and personal relationships, occasionally there are massive events that engulf everyone. And you can sweep up everyone in sort of and capture them in one moment and use that moment to get to the gospel and how it relates to that. John MacArthur just described a crucial part of his ministry and the ministry of every expositor. You equip people to understand the times, to think biblically about where history is headed. To do that, you have to be discerning. You have to know what is capturing the imagination of your people. And in those moments, you better be ready to point people to the text. What we needed in that moment was clarity. We needed gospel clarity. We needed the truth of God's word to be brought to bear on a situation that had unsettled our entire nation. And on that evening service, September 16th, 2001, that's exactly what Pastor John did. He brought the truth of God's word to bear on that momentous event in a way that those who were there will never forget. And by not only explaining why tragedy takes place, why bad things happen, he also explained the solution for those things is the gospel. And so it was a message not just that brought clarity, it also brought hope and hope of the truest kind, the hope that lasts eternal. And that's what was so impactful about that evening message is 
Pastor John gave the congregation the grid to understand what's happening through. Death is real and it reigns and only Christ can free you from it. And that's what, that was the message the congregation needed um, to properly understand the event that was shaping the, the world for decades to come. It's really time for people to take life and death seriously, don't you think? Enough of the parties, enough of the games. It's time to repent and call on God to save you from eternal hell. You're living on borrowed time. It's as if Christ is saying to the Father, well, just, just, get, just, just another, l- l- let me work on it another year. I think it's time for preachers to stop the theatrics, the psychobabble, and the funny stories, the trivial entertainment. Speak of life and death matters in biblical terms and rescue the perishing and care for the dying. It's time for you to make your life count as a gospel witness. What else matters? Anything else matter? September 11th was an attack on our country from the outside, and MacArthur spoke prophetically in a crisis that no one could ignore. Now we turn to another attack. This wasn't an act of geopolitical terrorism, but it's terrorism nonetheless. This was an attack on the church from the inside. And the best way I know how to begin this story is to draw your attention to the opening lines of Sinclair Lewis's 1927 novel, Elmer Gantry. It's a classic portrayal of ministerial hypocrisy. The main character is a fiery preacher who condemns immorality and ambition while practicing both. Since both the author and the fictional Gantry are from the Midwest, I asked my friend Paul Twiss, who's from the Midwest of England, to read it for us. Elmer Gantry was drunk. He was eloquently drunk, lovingly and pugnaciously drunk. He leaned against the bar of the old home sample room, the most gilded and urban saloon in Cato, Missouri and requested the bartender to join him in the good old summertime, the waltz of the day. Blowing on a glass, polishing it and glancing at Elmer through its flashing rotundity, the bartender remarked that he wasn't much of a hand at this here singing business, but he smiled. No bartender could have done other than smile on Elmer. So inspired and full of gallantry and hell-raising was he, and so dominating was his beefy grin. He was born to be a senator. He never said anything important, and he always said it sonorously. He could make good morning seem profound as can't, welcoming as a brass band and uplifting as a cathedral organ. It was a cello, his voice, and in the enchantment of it, you did not hear his slang, his boasting, his smut, and the dreadful violence which, at this period, he performed on singulars and plurals. Since Lewis's satirical novel was published nearly a century ago, his portrait of hypocrisy in the pulpit has proven to be no tall tale. And that's perhaps nowhere better seen than in the year 1988, when a living, breathing version of Elmer Gantry made headlines across the nation. This is the CBS Sunday Night News. Susan Spencer reporting. Good evening. The evangelical world was shocked today by the tearful confession of one of its leading TV preachers, Jimmy Swaggart, that he had sinned against God and family. This amid reports of a church investigation involving photographs of Swaggart with a prostitute. But Nightline has learned more of the facts of the case. They add up to a story of intense rivalry and infighting between ministers competing for the same religious audience. Central to that story, of course, are charges of sexual misconduct involving prostitutes. We want to caution you that some of this information is sexually explicit. You may choose not to watch or to encourage members of your family not to watch. Here is Nightline correspondent James Walker. Okay. I should mention that you don't need to hide your kids. We're going to keep this thing PG as we talk about Jimmy Swaggart, which isn't easy to do. 
But before we get to the downfall, we need to understand how Jimmy Swagger became an evangelical star. A man who Dan Rather, CBS News anchor, called the most effective speaker in the country. To get the Swagger story and how his television career fit into the larger narrative of Christian media in the 1970s and 80s, I called Professor John Wigger. Dr. Wigger teaches history at the University of Missouri. He's the author of PTL, The Rise and Fall of Jim and Tammy Faye Baker's Evangelical Empire. It's a behind-the-scenes look at one of the biggest scandals in modern evangelicalism. And, as Dr. Wigger says in the book, it's a story with close ties to the Jimmy Swaggart scandal. I asked him for a little background on Jimmy Swaggart and his connection to the Bakers. Jimmy Swaggart was from Louisiana. Um, he, he grew up in Faraday, Louisiana. His cousin was the uh, rock and roll pioneer Jerry Lee Lewis. Um, they were very close growing up, according to Swaggart's account. Um, they learned to play piano together um, in a similar style. And uh, they both attended Assemblies of God churches. Um, that was a part of their upbringing. Jimmy Swaggart and his wife Frances married when he was 17 and she was 15, um, which seems really young, but for their extended family, that was not um, all that uncommon. Um, Jim Baker used to uh, like to say that he grew up in poverty, but Jimmy Swaggart actually did. Whereas his cousin, Jerry Lee Lewis, became a musician and went off to you know, fame and fortune, um, Jimmy wanted to be a preacher, and he was incredibly uh, persuasive. Um, he had what Pentecostals often refer to as an anointing, and his ministry grew. Um, through the 1960s um, uh, into the 1970s. And by the time of the scandals around both of their ministries, um, Jimmy Swaggart's ministry was about the same size as Jim Baker's. They were aimed at different audiences and they were um, organized differently. Um, but uh, in terms of annual revenues and the number of employees, they were actually about the same size. Swaggart's program was broadcast on the PTL network, as almost everyone else's was. Uh, I mean, they had 24 hours a day of time slots to fill, seven days a week. Swaggart was more of a mainline Pentecostal. Um, he had a much bigger audience internationally, um, he was much more of a kind of traditional fire and brimstone Pentecostal preacher. Uh, the Bakers did something different, which is they, they really pioneered this new style of talk show. The PTL Club, also known as the Jim and Tammy Show, was the darling of evangelical television. Their TV show and their network reigned supreme during the golden age of televangelism. Men like Oral Roberts, Pat Robertson, and Jerry Falwell had established the genre, but the Bakers mastered it. They figured out how to harness the power of satellite television to attract millions of viewers to PTL. Here again is Dr. Wigger. At that point in time in the 1970s and 1980s, um, television was this incredible cultural force uh, in, in American society. Nearly everyone watched television. And up to the 1970s, when they watched television, they mainly watched the three major networks. It's different today because, of course, um, in this time period, in the 70s and 80s, there was no internet. Your choice of watching uh, television stations was pretty limited. What PTL in particular did that was innovative and revolutionary was they appreciated the potential of satellite television before almost anyone else. Ted Turner uh, was the first to really appreciate the possibilities of satellite television and he created his super station in Atlanta. Baker and PTL were really the first private satellite network. 
a year before ESPN. So this is this is part of what they're doing is they're finding they're using uh, new technology, which they are part of inventing to give them access to uh, a new audience or at least a new way to contact a really big audience. The ability to reach millions of people through television was highly addictive to personalities like Jim and Tammy Faye and Jimmy Swagger. They were convinced that their programs would take the gospel to the ends of the earth. The problem was Jim Baker and Jimmy Swagger were Elmer Gantries, huge hypocrites. In 1987, Jim Baker went to jail for fraud and tax evasion. A woman named Jessica Hahn accused him of rape, and there were numerous other indiscretions. Unlike Baker's theme park, Heritage USA, his personal life was not family friendly. Well, of course, PTL falls apart when the Jessica Hahn scandal becomes public. But as as much as that was um, the kind of uh, precipitating event of PTL collapsing, it really wasn't. The primary thing that brought PTL down was their financial corruption, so to speak. And so, I mean, when once all of that got exposed, that's, I think, the thing that really undermined or led to the collapse of PTL. Jessica Hahn was a church secretary in the 1980s and a big fan of PTL. Jim Baker was a hero to her, which made it all the more traumatizing when this evangelical celebrity took advantage of her in that Florida hotel. She was 21 years old when this, Thing happened with Jim Baker. Um, she was completely committed to her church. Um, she really was the one that that uh, uh, was, you know, someone in the church should have stood up for her, and no one did that. Um, and I think that's another part of how these things fall apart, and you focus on the celebrities and the the pastors and the leaders, but um, sometimes the people who are really the ones who kind of get hurt the most in these situations, um, that, that there's, there's really no one, no one standing up for them, and in this case, there should have been. The media had a field day with the Baker's fall. It damaged the reputation of all evangelicals. But when Jimmy Swaggart was caught in immorality just a year later, a second celebrity downfall created a crisis of confidence. Jesse Johnson has a personal example of what I'm talking about. After discussing John's 9-11 sermon, the conversation drifted into the Jimmy Swaggart part of this episode, and Jesse told me a wild story about his grandfather, Harold. So, yeah, he was, he was crazy. Uh, like, demon casting out, spirit binding, kind of crazy who uh, would lay hands on me and pray. He never explained the gospel to me that I remember, but he would lay hands on me and pray for me uh, often in tongues. And it did not have a like a edifying, conversive effect on me. Uh, but I remember when Jimmy Swaggart fell and Harold, Grandpa Harold was at our house and it was on TV. I have sinned against you, my Lord. And I would ask that your precious blood would wash and cleanse every stain. And he got down on his hands and knees in front of the TV. He laid hands on the TV and started weeping. Why, why, why? Uh, and my dad, who is not a Christian, uh, and my stepmom, who's you know not following the Lord, were watching my grandfather weep with his hands on the TV, looking at me, just shaking their head. And my dad told me, I mean, this is why you stay away from religion, things like that. Believers and non-believers alike watched Swagger confess. They watched him cry and weep and manipulate the crowd, trying to make them feel sorry for him. And they saw a charlatan, Elmer Gantry in the flesh. This ubiquitous television evangelist who um, 
everybody had seen on, on Christian television was caught with a prostitute and uh, the fall was monumental. And I felt like this is a teaching moment. And I spoke on the fall of Jimmy Swaggart. What leads to that? With Jimmy Swaggart's confession, non-believers had yet another example of Christian hypocrisy. Another reason to distrust the message that men like Swagger said they believed. And around that same time, John MacArthur was scheduled to preach at chapel at the Master's College. He was just a few years into his tenure as president. The emphasis of our chapel this morning has been to think about this matter of holiness and godliness. With that in mind, I want to speak this morning on the subject, what we learn from the fall of Jimmy Swaggart. You have lived, young people, to see what amounts to the most far-reaching scandal in the history of the Christian church. There has never occurred in Christianity anything of this proportion. This summer I will have occasion to be in Asia. In many of the places where I will travel in Asia, I will come across what reflects the extensive influence of Jimmy Swaggart. Coming out of the Manila airport and heading for the city of Manila, you pass a large building, I'm told, that says Jimmy Swaggart Ministries. This thing has scandalized the world from one end to the other because of the power of media. It has become a tremendous reproach to the name of Jesus Christ, to his church, to all who preach the word of God, bringing them under suspicion. It has far greater implications than the PTL scandal with Jim Baker and Tammy ever had. Because when Jim and Tammy Baker were discovered to be uh, sinners who were hypocritically pretending to be something they were not, the world said to itself, isn't that terrible that those people did that? I wonder if the rest are like that. And when it was exposed that Jimmy Swaggart was involved in sexual perversion over a long, long period of time, most people in the world must have concluded, well, they are, aren't they? The far-reaching implications of this are just frightening. In terms of the integrity, the credibility of the church, and of those who name the name of Christ. And I know myself that when I came to my church on Sunday and stood up before those people, some people sitting in that congregation were wondering in their mind whether or not I was really legitimate. I know that. And asking the question in their own mind, whether they really wanted to or not consciously, I wonder if MacArthur's got something going on the side. This is a profound blight on the history of the church. From there, John MacArthur gives the college students 12 lessons they should learn from the fall of Jimmy Swagger. Let's go through them. This will be the fastest sermon J-Mac has ever preached. False spiritual standards cannot restrain the flesh the danger of a shallow theology and an emotional religion. How important it is to uphold the true standard for spiritual leaders, the fragile nature of spiritual credibility, the ugliness of hypocrisy, the power of the gospel to go beyond the vehicle that proclaims it, the power of self-deception, the danger of pride and ego fulfillment the disastrous result of having your sin revealed, the false standard of spiritual success. Sin cannot be confined to one area of your life. You can't compartmentalize sin. The need to serve God for his approval, not men's. Recently, John and I talked about that sermon and what lessons have endured over the past three plus decades. I remember doing an interview with NBC many years ago, and the the anchor said to me, who is in charge? And it was right after Jimmy Swaggart's thing. Who is in charge of this Christian movement? Isn't somebody in charge of this? And I said, um, well, no, no. There's, a, there's an autonomy in this that allows or the kind of scandal that happens. Um, but in the end, 
That's only on the human level. On the divine level, God maintains his righteousness and his judgment on all accounts. He is the judge of all the earth and judgment begins at the house of God. So if you're messing around in your life with iniquity, I would suggest to you that it is most consistently like the Lord to expose publicly what you're hiding privately. He's not going to accommodate that. You say, well, what about the future of the church? He's in control of the future of the church. He will build his church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it, but he will judge his people openly. So I think you, you have to understand that it is the Lord's pattern to reveal what hypocrites are hiding publicly. And I think that's very important for the life of the church because I think the watching world needs to know, if they know anything, that church is serious and God is serious and sin is serious and salvation is glorious. Men called to lead God's people must guide them through crisis with that kind of biblical clarity because crises will come, towers will fall, and so will spiritual leaders. Death stalks every man and false teachers sabotage the church. Expositors can't be passive. They have God's perspective in the scriptures and they must actively apply it. They must follow the wisdom of Alexander Strzok. In his commentary on Acts 20, titled, Fierce Wolves Are Coming, Guard the Flock, he says this, A good watchman shepherd is never passive, but always alert. He knows the necessity of acting quickly and decisively in the face of danger. Since the Holy Spirit placed the elders as overseers to shepherd the church, they have a God-given authority to stop, silence, rebuke, and discipline false teachers. To be given the authority by God to govern and protect, and not to act at the moment of crisis, would be a colossal failure of leadership. Listen as John MacArthur does exactly that at the end of his 1988 sermon. Well, young people, these are some things I hope you think about, and I hope they help you to be discerning. Don't be taken in. Be very discerning. Let me say this in closing, all right? Say, so what's my response to be to this whole thing? Personally, in behalf of Jimmy Swaggart, I think we should pray for him. We should pray that God would grant him repentance that God would restore him to himself, that God would, would pour out on him the grace of forgiveness, the same grace that I need, that you need, right? Secondly, we should recognize that um, the seeds of Jimmy Swaggart's sin may be found in all our sins. Is that not true? That he is not a solitary monster in human history. We are all potentially the same kind of monster who could sin at the same proportion if given the same influence. And so we are not saying this is one solitary figure in history who has gone beyond the realm of human normalcy. Not so. Each one of us has the potential in our human hearts to be so self-deceived, so prideful, so driven into the flesh that we too could sin against God in such a way, given the same sphere of influence, our crash could be equally as disastrous. Lest we become proud in our own self-righteousness, it should drive us to hold carefully to that slender thread of spiritual credibility and to cling deeply to that desire to be well-pleasing to God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And we pray for him on the one hand, and we pray for each other that we should not be ever in such a situation. And then the third thing that I would encourage you to pray for is pray for the integrity of the church. Pray for the people who are who have to bear the burden of all of this, the brunt of this. Pray somehow that God would lift up in this country some kind of spiritual leadership that has integrity. Can you imagine what the world thinks of us in the church? I mean, they must be laughing at us. What a pile of phonies these people are. 
And all that does is justify their ungodliness. They're no different than the rest of us. Religion is a joke. Christianity is a farce. And then, too, I think it's important for us to realize that in spite of all of this, the Lord Jesus will still build His church and the gates of hell won't prevail against it. Amen? Isn't that wonderful to know? There have been scandals before, there will be scandals afterwards, but God is still on His throne. And I'm still committed to the ministry, still excited about it, and still do know that when the Spirit of God redeems somebody, Jimmy Swaggart or anybody else isn't going to stop that. Thanks for listening to Episode 5 of The Expositor, Season 1 of the MacArthur Center Podcast. Today, we saw how The Expositor responds to crisis. Next time, we'll find out how he responds to false teaching. And you'll also find out what happened in 2013 when James McDonald and Mark Driscoll stole my phone in the Grace Church parking lot. Tune in next time. The Expositor is produced by Corey Williams and Jeremy Vuolo. Cody Signore pumps up the jams. Special thanks to Carl Miller, Dr. Wigger, and the Lobo, Jesse Johnson, as well as my dear friend, Nathan Busnitz. One thing I'd ask of you, dear listener, is would you be willing to rate and review our podcast? It helps us somehow, I'm told. For more information about the MacArthur Center for Expository Preaching, go to macarthurcenter.org and to learn more about the Master's Seminary, go to tms.edu. ATD, out.